Um, he is an expert in the field of mandalas connected to the human psyche, geometry, and spirituality. And he found that geometry can have a profound power to influence the human consciousness. Um, Jeff is well known for his meditations, but tonight his slot was a bit too short for that, so he will talk now about crop circle geometry. A warm hand for Jeff Fitzpatrick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello everybody. Uh, so thanks to Karen, I'm now the guy that falls in love with crop circles. <laughs> That's a great introduction. You know, but it's kind of true in a way. Um, I came here in 2012 and actually, uh, you know, uh, I, was, I lay for a whole evening in a beautiful crop circle that was just there in that field in Stanton St. Bernard. And um, I had a life-changing event happen to me, to be honest. Um, and ever since that, I've come back every year. I've been up on an early flight today from Dublin to come and speak with you. So it's really a great privilege to be able to share my passion with you. So um, for me, the crop circle uh, phenomenon is um, very much about sacred geometry. For two decades, I've really been very interested in exploring consciousness. It's kind of like just been a, a hobby of mine. And sacred geometry, drawing mandalas, has been a really useful tool for opening my mind, I suppose. And I'm, I'm interested in sacred geometry in all areas, like I'm interested in sacred geometry in ancient architecture, in nature, in philosophy, um, in, in any, anywhere sacred geometry shows up. And, and then it was only around 2010 I came across crop circles. And what really um, drew me into the phenomenon was the sacred geometry. Uh, and so I kind of look at crop circles like it's a tree with many, many branches. And what I'd like to share with you tonight is a little bit of maybe what I get from the phenomenon for me personally, uh, to sort of add the, the spoke on the wheel that works for me, you know? So, um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. The, there's a wide range of, of geometric exercises I could choose to talk about, but because I have 20 minutes, um, I've chosen one. And it's a, it's a phenomenon called squaring the circle. Um, and it's a very ancient kind of geometer's, philosopher's conundrum, which is basically an attempt to reconcile the impossible. It's, a, it's this attempt to um, marry heaven and earth essentially and it's kind of like a philosophical invitation so what do i mean when i say squaring the circle i'll just clarify that so essentially what we're talking about geometrically is you're trying to draw a square and a circle overlaid on top of each other that either have there's two versions of this it can be exactly the same perimeter or it can be exactly the same area Oftentimes people will talk about squaring the circle and it can be one of those two things. You'll see the corners protrude out a little bit more on the area one. Um, so this is, this is a recurring theme that comes back and comes back and continually, it's, it's so ever present in the crop circle phenomenon that it's really caught my attention over the years. So this is what I'd like to talk to you tonight about, if that's okay. Um, so. I just want to share with you a little bit about the um, qualities of the square and the qualities of the circle. To, to give you an idea from the, geom the geometry perspective, all of these archetypes, these shapes, have certain qualities to them. So the square um, is very different to the circle. So if I um, show you a circle, for example, maybe we'll just playfully enjoy the circle and the square here. Um, I'll flick between them, and if you just let it sort of like drop into your psyche, and just, just without overthinking it, you know, do they feel a little bit different? Do they have a slightly different impression upon your psyche? Can I have a show of hands if anybody felt a little bit of a difference between, between the two? A little bit of a difference. Wow, okay, great. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. We don't even have to know what that is. It's just kind of cool that that happens, you know? So the circle tends to represent um, the infinite, the unseen, the um, paranormal, the hard to attain, the transcendent, the spiritual, faith. 
Um, and the reason there's this kind of unobtainable, elusive, mysterious component to the circle is because there's this very special relationship between the, cir uh, the circumference and the diameter, which, which is based on pi. And pi is a transcendent number which never ends and never repeats. And it goes forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And in this very, very simple shape, we're left with something missing. So conversely, the square is kind of the opposite, although I don't totally treat the circle and the square as opposites per se, but, but they are very much different archetypes. And the square, by contrast, is very concrete, it's very definite. I can say, can you see the top left corner of the square? And everyone can go, yeah, that's easy. But if I go, can you see the top left corner of the circle? It's kind of like, oh, well, it could be, I'm not sure exactly where that is. It's more slippery, the circle, you know, it's like, ooh, you know, it's tr just can't quite grab it. You know, where the, the square is like, it's definite. If we can measure the square exactly, if this is like one foot, if the side is one foot, then the, the perimeter is exactly four feet. It's easy. It tends to have um, the four directions, the four elements, earth, air, fire, water. Um, and so then if we, if we bring those archetypes into how they affect our psyches, the, the square tends to be about being certain, being definite, knowing exactly what's what, and not taking any nonsense. You might, I'm, I'm sure you have the phrase here in the UK that, you know, uh, she's a bit of a square, or he's a bit of a square, oftentimes means somebody can be quite fixed in their point of view. And conversely, you can have um, somebody who's a bit loopy as well, which is like, you know, somebody who maybe has a very open mind and, and, and sometimes can run the risk of not being so grounded. So, so these two archetypes are constantly in, at inter, uh, interplaying with, with us uh, interpersonally, but also magically in the crop circles. These are just some little diagrams about how you actually uh, geometrically capture these. So where on earth do we witness a beautiful, sublime, continuous revelation of ingenious and original displays of the squared circle symbol? Well, hooray, that's why we're here. Um, the crop circles, of course. It's really quite amazing that this shape continually shows up and shows up and shows up. And it shows up in a really magical way. It's not like straight in your face, like, oh, there's another squared circle. It shows up in a kind of a subtle, kind of inviting way. It invites you to sort of unlock where the squared circle is. So, you know, here's a few examples of the formation in the field, obviously. And then this one is beautiful. It's like the squared circle. You can see the hidden square and circle there has been drawn over four times in this case. But here's a simpler one. Again, this is like a little symbol that's, in, that's clothing a squared circle. The reconciliation of heaven and earth is being brought forward. So these particular crop circles that I'm going to speak with you tonight uh, about are like one particular family of crop circle, I suppose. They're based, they're called quintuplets or quintuplets, it's like tomato, tomato, but however you want to say it. It's basically like um, the number five on the face of a dice, where you have a central circle, usually called a mother circle, and then you have four s smaller circles, oftentimes, most of the time, it can vary. You have smaller satellite circles around the circumference, and that's what a, a quintuplet is called. And these are particularly um, effective symbols for transmitting this relationship between the square and the circle. And every year they just keep coming over and over again in the most incredible way. These are just a few examples. So I'm glad um, Robert, yes, you mentioned Alan Brown earlier. And um, I, I just wanted to sort of honour Alan Brown as well because he, for me, um, most of this uh, sharing tonight comes directly from the work. I was given a manuscript six years ago um, from Alan Brown, who's this kind of master geometer, who has spent nearly two decades um, unwrapping the kind of codes that lie beneath these formations and, and sharing this sequence of steps. It's still unpublished until the day, although I do hear some rumours that maybe John Mark now will hopefully publish it, which would be fantastic. 
um, because it's such, such rich work. Probably the most impressive sacred geometry I've ever been gifted, and it's still blowing my mind. So I'd like to share two examples of Alan's work with you tonight in the hope of revealing some of the hidden magic that lies beneath the formations. Does that sound okay? Yeah. 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 Um, so these are just two of Alan's books. They're written with the um, legendary John Michel, um, who's another awesome geometer. But I just wanted to honour him, and uh, I, these are highly recommended reading, basically, <coughs> both these books. So this is the actual manuscript, and these are all of the formations that display the reconciliation of this heavenly form with the earthly form. And it really is one of the most incredible um, pieces of work that I've come across that shows not just the magic of crop circles, but actually the beauty of sacred geometry as well. So you can see, sorry, just to show you, he's done about 64 of these formations running back over 20 years, I think. So let's start with an easy one. And I'm going to try and bring you with me so that um, I can make it easy, you know. Um, this, is, this is like one of the examples that Alan has done. He's basically, this is the way he's, he's done each quintuplet. He's analyzed exactly what it's like in the, in the field and then he's put the idealized squared circle together, which is this here. And then he has the actual formation exactly as it showed up, and he even goes into the deviation between the two of them. But I don't want to get too technical and scare people off that it's like being back in school, you know? I want to try and show you some of the beauty and the magic behind this. So, quite simply, that formation, very, very simply, you can see the big mother circle and the four satellite circles around the edge. Well. What I want to show you is the hidden geometry that lies beneath these crop circles, which really displays this kind of secret code that actually gives form and shape to the, to the formation. And this quite simply is two pentagrams are simply put, to, put together. You draw a pentagram and then you draw the central circle. You see that here? It gives you the size of the mother circle. And then you just drop another pentagram in there and it's the small little enclosing in the central pentagon gives you the exact size, but not only the size, but the exact distance from the mother circle. Does that make sense? Because so oftentimes when you see this for the first time, it can be tricky to guess. Shall I say that again? Yes. Yeah? So basically, what I'm trying to show you, here's the finished formation, okay? And that's just, you know, to all intents and purposes, you would be forgiven for saying, oh, that's nice, it's kind of five little circles in a field, no big deal. It's certainly not like the big elaborate masterpieces we see, but, but kind of silently and elegantly and beautifully under the surface, there's this gorgeous geometry that's kind of winking at us, saying, hey, there's more to this than meets the eye, literally. Um, so let's do it again. You essentially, how do we get this exact shape? How do we know that this circle is exactly this size? How do we know that these circles are exactly this size? And how do we know that these small circles are exactly this distance from the mother circle? Okay? So, and essentially what we do is we draw a simple five-pointed star. You see that five-pointed star? And in the center of that five-pointed star, you have a pentagon. And what we do is we just basically close a circle in that middle pentagon. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And then we simply do the same thing again at a smaller octave where we put in another little pentagon, pentagram here, and we get the small circle. So the point I'm trying to make is this entire shape is birthed through very coherent geometry. Okay, and that would be cool because that's what gives you the shape which then, by the way, gives you a perfect 99.99 squared circle, which is kind of mind-boggling to think that these random five circles in a field end up with this kind of supreme archetype of the marriage of heaven and earth. Okay, but let's take the plot a little, because um, not only does Alan show that the squared circle shows up in the field, but he actually shows these sequence of steps that need to be taken to capture this particular shape. So 
we're not just going, oh my God, that's cool, there's a lovely formation and it's a squared circle, let's all go back to sleep, America. No, we're not saying that. We're saying on one level, this is amazing, like this is another, another demonstration of this recurring theme that we see year on year of squared circle. And it feels like an invitation to me. What I mean by that is like, if we aim to reconcile the square and the circle inside ourselves, it can be a really beneficial thing to do when we begin to examine are we living more out of our circle, are we living more out of our square, and sometimes bringing both of those into harmony can be really empowering actually. So we'll do one more example, I hope this isn't like school, sometimes my friends give out to me and they say this is so boring, it's like you're back in maths class, you know, <laughs> but, but for me, for whatever reason, this is the most beautiful magic um, on planet Earth, to be honest. So, um, here's another interesting one, why I picked this one is because you'll see this is a big mother circle in the centre here, and interestingly, it has two pairs of circles which are different sizes, a pair of big circles and a pair of little circles. So you can't be forgiven saying, oh God, like maybe that's a bit wonky, maybe it's not as symmetric, uh, you know, but nothing is by accident with these formations. And there's such an absolutely beautiful sequence of geometric relationships revealed in how you get to the squared circle in this particular one. I won't spend as long on this, but I'll just bring it through. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, these steps, which essentially is you draw a pentagon, you draw four, five boxes out of the pentagon, you draw a simple, this is called a vesica shape here, gives you all the relative proportions. I won't go too into the detail, but what Alan has revealed here is incredible to me. It's absolutely incredible that these relationships, which I've never read in any geometry book, I've never seen them anywhere else. It's like a new teaching of geometric relationships that are being revealed secretly through the formations. And it's just super awesome and also undeniable. It's kind of like, it's plain as day to see. Okay, so back to the two different size circles then. Just to kind of curtain closer on this is when Alan got to the end of this, he had, in order to get the squared circle, those two different size circles are necessary. They're actually necessary to, to close the squared circle with these particular circles. But do you see this little thing here? This small apex, the, the center point. This is essentially this large circle overlaid on a small circle. No big deal, you might say. But it just happens to enclose perfectly this eight-pointed octagram geometric star. And so what's happening here is we're getting like, kind of like up upgrades of like new geometric knowledge through these, se these sequence of steps, which has been gifted to us by the formations, by the authors of the formations, by Alan Brown. I get dizzy sometimes. I don't know where like the magic of crop circles ends and the brilliance of Alan Brown begins, and it's all like a confusing continuum to me. But what I adore is is the beauty and the harmony and the order that's undeniable in crop circles. So I hope that um, has helped share a little bit of my passion and the spoke on the wheel that really lights me up with this phenomenon. And uh, I'm hugely passionate about the hidden geometry underneath these things. It excites me greatly. So I was just going to say, if I, would I have two minutes, Roland, before we close? Just two. Just two? I just want to do a very, very quick exercise for a bit of fun, if it felt okay. It's just, it's a simple exercise for yourself. I call it, it's called squaring the circle inside yourself, okay? And like when I showed you the circle and the square at the beginning of the presentation, I just wanted you to sort of take literally 30 seconds looking at the circle and maybe close your eyes if you want, take it inside and think about where in, in your temperament, in your disposition, in your way of interfacing with the world, are you circular, are you open, are you, uh, do you have faith, do you think about mystery, do you think about the unanswerable, they're all the kind of circular concepts that we have and, and we'll, do, we'll start with the square actually, which is the opposite and we finish with the circle. So this, oh, oh, whoops, I went too far, sorry. Okay. Sorry, Kathy, forgive me. Okay, so the square is like, where in your life are you fixed in your thinking? 
Are you like definite, certain? Nobody can argue with you. I know this for a fact. And you know, sometimes we can all have aspects of ourselves which are quite fixed. And that can be really helpful. This isn't like one archetype is bad and the other is good. Both of them are really useful actually. Both of them have good sides and bad sides. So just t take, let's do 10 seconds, because I want to be nice to Roland on time. Let's do 10 seconds on the square. Just really allow yourself, think about where in your life you certain, fixed, definite. And then just to bring alongside that, not Cathy's presentation, but the circle. Think about where in your life you're open. Where is there a mystery? Where do you invite the unseen, the spiritual? Well, it's been a real pleasure, everybody. Thank you very much.